I'm here. Uh, hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to our special event. Um, we're excited to be able to reconnect with all of you and uh, learn about what happened um, with your Antarctica experiences. Um, today is Wednesday, June 24th, 2015, and um, the this whole event is about uh, finding what happened on your experience and kind of reflecting and sharing it with the others and then kind of moving, before, moving beyond and, and talking about what happens next. So with that, um, we'll turn it to the next slide, um, which is just a real quick overview. Most of you have done this one or two times before, at least. Um, it's about the platform using Blackboard Collaborate. And if you can't hear me, um, please let me know. I am on a headset, so sometimes it's hard to hear uh, what's going on. But uh, Blackboard Collaborate, uh, you should see the content showing up um, in the center of the screen. Uh, we enabled video today. If you um, have a webcam on your uh, computer, you can use that. Uh, click on video when you're ready. And then um, you'll also, if you're talking, you actually also need to click on the talk button. Um, say what you need to say, and then unclick both the talk and the video. And somebody just joined by phone, and that is awesome. Who just joined by phone? Hi, it's Yamini. Hi. Welcome. So we're just getting started, and are you, are you going to be able to join us online too? Um, I am trying right now, but it's not being super cooperative. So I'm trying to download it again. Okay. Yep, uh, just let us know if you have any issues. Um, I know there are a couple of other people that just joined in, and we'll go around and, and let everybody introduce themselves again here in a moment. And then um, in a, if you are online, you can type your things in the chat, but it's also a small group, so just let us know if you have a question, and we'll let you talk live, of course. And if you're on the phone um, and not on the Internet, uh, just uh, Remind us and say, "Hey, I have a question," and interrupt, um, and Sarah and I can direct you that way. Um, I think that's it. Uh, like Sarah said, this is being archived, so if you have to drop out early, just let us know. Um, the next uh, slide is just a little review of questions and discussions. Just like I said, typing your stuff in the chat box, and and we'll go on from there. Uh, the agenda. So um, today, um, and in the emails you saw. Uh, Everything about uh, reflecting on the experience. So we have a number of slides that um, cover what the teacher's viewpoint is. We have some researchers online that will share their reflections. We actually have some alumni that will talk about um, their advice of what you do once you've had these experiences and you're just coming back from the field. We'll talk about what comes up next. And of course, we'll relay any important information and updates and things to you um, that we need to share at the end. Um, just a real, give you a recap of, um, and I'll try for the phone people that don't have internet, which I know there's a couple of you, but remember to tell you where we are. But um, the, the slide that we're on is about core track participants, and it's an overview of the number of teachers that we have had um, in this program. And uh, on the slide, you can see that we've had uh, different award years, and it gives a total of teachers for the Arctic and the Antarctic by year. And I think the critical piece is to see that um, in the last the last couple of years, it's one of some of the higher years of teachers out in the field. And overall, we've had um, 136 teachers, predominantly Arctic. Um, Antarctic is slowly catching up. Um, and uh, out of that, it also the total reflects that we've also had some Einstein fellows, which some of you remember from orientation, um, Einstein fellows joining us as well. So it just kind of gives you an idea of um, the number of participants that we've had. Another thing that we wanted to share with you is some of the products and uh, kind of highlights of Polar Trek. So um, over, uh, I will read this for the phone person people. Um, we've had over 100 polar related lessons developed by you, uh, the teachers. These are the requirements that the teachers are, are supposed to do at the end of an um, expedition. So we've had that during the resource section of the Polar Trek website. Um, 
We've connected over 50,000 participants um, through live events, and of those participants, 82% were for the very first time that they've ever joined a, uh, a webinar, a Polar Connect webinar on about the polar regions. Um, also to our website, we've had over over a million, 700,000 unique visitors, I mean, sorry, over a half million, 700 unique visitors to our website and over 2 million unique page visits to the website. So that's like people just coming in um, to check it out and, and move around through the website and not repeat visitors. Those are unique in one time. Um, and we've also included um, and worked with all the partners listed here as well as some others, that, um, but these are predominantly the big partners, NASA, NOAA, U.S. Geological Survey, Bureau of Land Management, and the National Park Service. So just some highlights about the Polar, Polar Trek program. Um, some things you may not be aware of, um, just because things have been changing over the last year, um, we've been working with Ronnie to kind of update and uh, showcase uh, some of the products uh, through Polar Trek. And Sarah put together this slide that has a list of links and where to find different things on the website. Of course, they're um, you can also do searches, but we've done classroom and uh, community lesson plans and the community lesson plans, um, some of the lessons come from, um, I guess they aren't really lessons or, well, I guess it, when you say community, are you thinking the, the Denali uh, climate change course and the products? Yeah. No, I wanted to include um, the folks who are not teaching in classrooms. So lessons and activities that are done, like Dominique does at a museum or okay. Alex, um, or are done at community events. So lots of different opportunities out there for resources. Yeah, and that, that's always evolving and growing from everything we do. We always add more resources. Um, we have a new thing this year that's definitely new since orientation last year, which is project pages. So for a teacher like Alex Eiler that's been out um, for several years, or the Ice Cube project that's had multiple uh, teachers on their project, um, we've added uh, we've kind of aggregated those different expeditions and created a project page which shows um, all those teachers and had kind of pulls all that information from all those expedition pages into one page and we call that a project page. So that's new. Um, it's a new way of looking at um, expeditions in the past. Uh, the other new thing is expedition reports, um, which was a requirement of this cohort, this group of teachers this year, to create these public science um, or expedition reports and put them out kind of in a public way. Um, you should check out, if you haven't done yours, <laughs> um, you should check out what the other folks have done from the Arctic in particular. They're really good and they've been, uh, we share those with NSF and the researchers as well. Um, product pages, again, it's kind of an aggregation of things that we have all over uh, the website into um, into one page, including um, evaluation reports and just a, a, a myriad of other things that we find useful and we want to share with people beyond just Arcus and our the immediate um, group of people, but like uh, funders as well. If you're ever looking for uh, photos. Um, I encourage you to access the Internet Media Archive that Arcus has. That's where all your photos go that you take. Um, and um, we have a, Joed enters them into the Media Archive with the metadata that you provided through those arduous uh, Excel spreadsheets. <laughs> and uh, uh, anyway, a lot of people, including the media, use that archive to, um, um, for public purposes. Um, and then again, portfolio pages. We can talk a little bit about this at the end, but you should uh, click, you can look at the member list on the front page and click on the person's photo and you'll see a portfolio page. And uh, they're for everybody there, but they're really, the, the teachers are probably have the most depth to their portfolio page and it shows everything that you've done 
um, and kind of include in the needs assessment and uh, your classroom information plan and your public science report, your journals, it kind of aggregates all that information into one place. And of course we have a public, uh, Polar Trick YouTube channel as well. Um, I think that's it for products. Any questions about products and where things live or how we're using them? Okay. We'll move on to the next um, next slide here. Yeah. Um, so our first one, we'll go through sort of in chronological order of people who um, deployed out to Antarctica. We will start with Jillian, um, and Jillian's at a workshop right now, so she's unable to attend the webinar. But she sent in um, an MP3 for us to listen to of her presentation. So I'll start that, and if anybody's having trouble hearing it, just kind of type in the chat box to let me know. And also a multimedia sort of screen will show up for you. If you just move that out of the way, then you'll be able to see the slides as well. So we'll start that in just a second here. Yeah, I was just going to say that if you've only joined us by phone, we aren't sure how this will uh, play to you. Um, but if you're a phone person um, and having trouble, I guess just let us know too. Phone people are not hearing it, I can tell you that from my thing. I'm online and I'm not hearing it either. Okay. All right, let me start over again and see what I can do. It might be because I'm on phone and computer. Um. From Sydney, San Diego, where I'm from. Okay, I'm so sorry I can't talk with you guys today, but I look forward. Hello, Paul Trek. This is Julia I'm speaking to you from Sydney, San Diego, where I'm participating in the Honeywell Green Boot Camp. I'm so sorry I can't talk with you guys today, but I look forward to watching the archive and, and seeing more than what I'm doing. Uh, your blogs. Uh, I was very fortunate. I got to go to uh, the Southern Ocean for an entire month last October to study sea floor spreading in the Antarctic circumpolar current. I was on the Nathaniel Par, and it's an amazing vessel. And you'll notice on the first slide we have Larry and Ian, our co-PIs, and then a very large science team. And one of the components that made our science team very unique is that there were six students from UT in, te in Texas. And it was those six students who really spent a great deal of time in teaching me some of the fundamentals of the geology that I had uh, forgotten over the last couple of, I'll just say, a couple of years. So if you go to the second slide, thanks, Sarah, uh, you'll notice in the upper right-hand corner there's some drawings. It was these same students who did a marvelous job of uh, taking the science that we're doing and putting it illustrations that I could understand as well as my students. We basically took acoustic soundings of the seafloor, looking for, we're looking for crust, we're looking for, as they say, basement, original floor, to look at for magnetic anomalies, to see how the seafloor has changed over millions of years, and how that's affected the development of the Antarctic circumpolar current. And if you'll notice, actually, the whole left side, uh, we've got the illustrations, and we've got a picture of raw data, and then at the bottom, that one picture is of actual of crust so we can, can get a better interpretation of how the seafloor looks hundreds of meters below the surface. Also on this cruise, uh, you'll see upper center, we set up three GPS stations on South Georgia looking at the movement of this small country um, and to see whether it's basically looking uh, I'm so sorry, I'm bumbling. To look and see if it's going to move back with the South American plate or keep moving in the direction that it's moving. We also did some dredging. 
uh, trying to get some samples of crust from the ocean floor. And we're very, very fortunate to, uh, a couple of times, get to go on South Georgia and look at some of the indigenous wildlife. I've never been this close to or seen a wandering albatross before, and it was amazing. I don't remember exactly what else uh, Sarah wanted for this. I hope this gives you a little bit of interpretation of what we're doing. I've been very active with my outreach and my next presentation, hopefully with Larry from the first slide, uh, to the Flagstaff Festival of Science this coming September. Still working with classes from last year and just making myself a better teacher through this experience. So thanks, Polar Trek. I hope you guys are all doing well. And thanks for your great blocks. Loved, loved, loved following along. Bye. All right. So um, I have difficulty hearing, but hopefully um, most of you were able to hear it. Probably some of the other telephone people had trouble as well. Um, Let me just check and see. Um, Yamini said she hung up because, but she's still online because um, it was clashing. But Dominic, do we still have you? I am still here. Okay. And Jim Madsen, do we have you also? No, he hasn't joined yet. I was just letting you know he was potentially going to join by phone. It's just okay. how many got there on the phone. Um, right. And Elaine is on the phone as well as online. And yeah, now I think I'll like right? to too. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. Well, thanks to Jillian for sending that along, even though she couldn't make it. So hopefully that worked for folks, um, and feedback on that is helpful. But uh, Larry, her researcher, um, knew that Jillian wasn't going to be participating, so was unable to come. But I'm going to turn it over, actually to Lucy um, for her report from her expedition. So Lucy, we'll turn the microphone to you. All right, thank you, Sarah. Um, hopefully my voice keeps going here. I'm a little bit ill. Um, but I'd love to share with you about my expedition. It was so wonderful. It was just an amazing experience. Um, we were in the dry valleys of Antarctica, and we were studying um, microbialite communities that live on the bottom of Lake Joyce. And um, the dry valleys are pretty inaccessible. We had to get there by helicopter. And, um, and we were at our remote field camp, which you can see um, in my slides. If you could move to the, my first slide there. <clears throat> yeah, awesome. So you can see some pictures of our remote camp where we stayed for six weeks. And um, the microbialites are these um, communities of bacteria that live on the bottom of the lake. And we study them to learn more about, um, well, we study them because they, we think they resemble um, communities of cyanobacteria from early Earth. And we hypothesized that this might be the sort of life forms that we would find on other planets. So we go to Antarctica to learn more about what those communities might, might be like. Um, and we accessed those communities by drilling through the ice, which was about four to five meters thick, and looking at them with um, cameras. And um, we also melted a hole in the ice that was about a meter wide. And we sent, had two divers on our team um, who went down to the bottom of the lakes and collected samples for us to um, investigate more. Um, our research project, um, you know, it was, it was a lot of long days of hard work out in the field, but it was also a lot of fun, and I learned so much about what it's like to do science and field work and um, hypothesize about different questions and wonder about what else is out there. Um, so that was really, really fun. Um, on the next slide, you can see some of my pictures from um, outreach activities that I've done. Um, you can also see uh, our diver going into the lake there. Um, but before I left, I was um, pretty busy doing outreach activities at different schools in the area and have um, stayed in touch with the teachers that I visited. Um, since returning, I've also done some programs with Boy Scouts and um, the Rotary Club and things like that. 
And just last week, um, I had the opportunity to go to Chicago with my research team and attend the Astrobiology Science Conference that was there where I presented a poster. And it was um, really wonderful to talk to other um, researchers who were interested in doing um, outreach activities at their universities. And they were, it was wonderful to meet them and just learn more about astrobiology as well. Um, and um, as far as integrating it into my classroom, astrobiology um, has so many ties to so many different disciplines in science that it really is a wonderful way to integrate um, real science in a very engaging way into my classroom and a lot of the different units of study, especially for life science. And there are connections to genetics and evolution and earth history. And um, it was really fun to develop a lesson at the end of the um, school year that kind of tied it all together um, and related to the expedition. So that was really a lot of fun. Um, and I'm looking forward to collaborating with my research team in the future. Um, because they're very close over at UC Davis, there's opportunities for us to visit. Um, and uh, they can be guest speakers in my classroom. And um, I'm looking forward to um, what that might look like in the future. Um, and I think um, I'm happy to answer questions, but I think that's um, my summary. So thank you. Great. Thanks, Lucy. Um, and I actually I'll turn it over to Dawn if you want to share a little bit as well. Please do. Yeah, so unfortunately I didn't get to go uh, in the field um, when Lucy was there. Um, but I know Tyler uh, really, really appreciated her presence and her help. And um, the, our entire group is, is really, really pleased with um, having Lucy integrated into it as a, as a tie to classroom teaching. And I put on the chat that um, at the Astrobiology Science Conference last week, um, Lucy really impressed the NASA Astrobiology Institute um, outreach and education people. And I, I think there's a lot of opportunity uh, for her to uh, build on those contacts with more opportunities and things like that. And we hope we can uh, connect with Polar Trek on that as well. Awesome. Very exciting. This is Janet. And somebody just uh, came in by phone. Who is that? That was me. Hello. Larry Walver. Oh, hi, Larry. <laughs> well, we just uh, um, we're, we just, just wrapping up uh, Lucy and uh, Dawn's project in Lake Joyce, Antarctica. And just before that, though, we heard from uh, Jillian. Um, uh, via an audio file she sent us because she's in um, a training right now in California and about her of what she did and kind of her reflection and I guess since she just joined us by phone I if you're ready we can put you on the spot and uh, you talk about uh, a little bit about working with the teacher and what it was like for you okay um, basically I think this is the third polar trek in quotes, uh, teacher I've had, and all of them have been utterly fantastic. And um, you know, there's a tremendous pressure to take quote a local teacher. And the once or twice that that's happened, it's not been nearly as good as the uh, polar trek vetted teachers. Over. Okay, great. Um, anything um, about uh, about you know what your plans are in the future, and whether you're going to involve teachers in the future, or um, or you're going to go with this project. That just to kind of give us an update. Um, hmm. I I just spent six hours driving to get here, so I'm really not thinking too hard. Um, okay, that's okay. No worries. <laughs> I know I just put put you on the spot there. It's all right, Larry. <laughs> anyway. Uh, Jillian's a very active person, as you're quite aware, and uh, eventually I think she's going to come visit and we're going to work some stuff out. But uh, 
neither of our schedules have been particularly compatible so far. Over. Okay. Yeah. No, that's fine. If you don't know what you're up to, and you should speak to with her. And I understand that. That uh, she's off in training right now, and summers get busy, and people are still working on things for next year. So it's no worries. All right. We're just gonna uh, cruise through. Let me catch up to where we are. Sarah, who's next? Uh, looks like we have. Yeah, you meant oh Alex. Sorry, I jumped ahead. Uh, Alex. Eilers and uh, Jennifer Burns. So, Alex, if you're available. Yeah, okay. So, um, so our project was entitled The Cost of a New Fur Coat. And it actually um, looked at the, the link between reproduction and molting. And the, one, well, everything about it was neat. But one of the neatest um, things about my first expedition um, which looked at the overwintering um, and foraging patterns of Waddell seals, is that there was a question on that previous in the 2012 expedition that led to the new research and the new project. Actually, really neat to to see um, that and how you know how that all worked. But the major research questions for this expedition um, was really how did mass the condition of the animal, the hormone levels um, within the animal, and the activity budget, how much energy they spend. So we were looking at how they change seasonally within um, the groups of animals we were studying. So we were studying all females, and we were studying um, what we call the skip females. So they had um, skipped a breeding cycle, but from uh, but we have known we had known that they were um, had given birth before. And then we also looked at reproductive um, um, females that had pupped earlier in that season and then later in that season. So we had three groups, early moms, late moms, and then skip females. And then the second question was really um, when does active gestation start and what are the factors that really um, influence pregnancy? And so we'll actually... Um, go down to um, the ice in the Erebus Bay, and we will find and capture, um, if we can go to the next slide, and kind of calm the seal. And then we actually start uh, collecting the samples. We'll take skin samples and blood samples and muscle and blubber and whiskers and fur, and we'll do weighing and measuring. And just by the samples there, you can actually find out um, a lot about the condition. Um, so the skin samples, what they're looking for is um, the skin follicles as to how, um, how active the, uh, or what stage of growth their uh, fur is in, because they have to, um, they, make, they do an annual molt in January and February. And then for the blood samples, they were looking at hormone levels, um, which can tell us you know, kind of what part of the critical life history events, you know, kind of where the seal is in these processes. Um, the muscles, they actually um, looked at the oxygen carrying capacity. Um, seals are excellent divers and, um, and because they carry a lot of oxygen in their muscles. Um, they, we looked at blubber and, I mean, blubber depth, how much um, blubber depth they have, and also looking at the, the lipids to find out which uh, fish they were eating. And then the whiskers and furs, obviously, um, you can do some assessments there. For the fur, you can get growth uh, when the, or the diet during when the fur is growing. And because the fur grows during a specific time, yet the whiskers actually grow throughout time, and so you can get a, um, a little more depth there. And then weighing and measuring the seal and applying tags. We applied three tags, a VHF tag, a satellite tag, and then a TDR, which is a time depth recorder. And that recorded um, depth every six seconds. Um, in the January and February season, and I will actually be going back in 2016, 
and we are going to recapture um, the seals that the the team. Well, well, there will be two seasons. Well, one season and two deployments. The November and December season, where we will actually do this initial um, uh, capture, and then we will we will try and recapture those same seals in the January and February, and look for mass changes dive patterns, and then the pregnancy status. So we haven't done that one yet, and um, this one will be a little bit different because we will actually be um, looking for pregnancy and um, utilizing a rectal probe, which I'm not sure how I feel about that quite yet. Um, but they're actually finding some really, um, really good stuff with that. Um, in terms of outreach, um, this is we just this is like my job basically, um, and we have been very very successful um, in our outreach. We've done uh, pre-service visits out to the schools. We've actually even contacted the Alaska schools um, in the Anchorage school district, and some of the graduate students are going out um, during that time. We are trying to reach a little further. Um, that way. Um, we've done some Ohio visits. Um, a group of students in Ohio um, invited me to, to come up. We have participated in just the beginning of June, we participated in the um, Animal Behavior Society Conference in Anchorage. And we did, um, well, actually, the graduate students did, a, did some presentations, and I actually helped with the education and outreach component. Um, that day, and we we did just some fun, unique things. Um, since we were going to the ice, we have a hockey team down here, and so we did a field trip face-off, which um, we kind of connected with all of the all the students that were going to the field trip face-off. Um, we did a twister conference, which, if I can remember these acronyms. Um, it is the Tennessee Women in Science, Technology, Engineering, and Research. We did a conference in November. And then, of course, we just did a lot of the fun things. Um, we did postcards. Um, we did the flags, which were hugely popular. And I think Jillian did that um, as well. But we did one unique thing. And I realized my um, I was not as prepared. Um, in my 2012 expedition, so I wanted to get myself fit. So we did a kind of a get fit campaign. And for every minute students studied about science or they exercised, they got a mile um, on their virtual journey from Memphis to Antarctica. And after every 60 minutes or 60 miles, um, it unlocked a different waypoint. And so that was just some of the outreach um, we are doing. And right now, we're trying to prepare for the January-February expedition. Great. Thanks, uh, Alex. Um, and so Alex has an alumni. And Alex, you can add a little more later on if you'd like to. But we also have Michelle and John who are here to share some alumni uh, advice on how to kind of continue working with research teams, and you've got a great example. Um, I just have to say, Alex, while you were chatting, Janet and I, I'm in Denali, and Janet's in Anchorage. We both just felt an earthquake that moved, like we're shaking oh our God. computers. So we almost just ran out the door and left you all behind. <laughs> uh, I'm glad things are uh, okay. I'm a little flushed, but I think we're good. All right. So I am going to turn it to, um, let's see, I don't think Jen is online. So I'll turn it over to uh, Yamini, who is, I uh, believe, on the computer now. So just press the talk button when you're ready. Hey, I'm ready. Um, are you guys sure you're OK with the earthquake and everything? Yeah, it was pretty exciting. I think we're good. I'll stick, I'll stick with you guys. OK. Um, all right, well, hi everybody. It's really great to hear about all your projects. Um, my name is Yamini. I was part of the Velvet Ice team and we were in Waste Divide. And you can go to the next slide. Um, so Waste Divide, the top left picture is, is Waste Divide, the, the um, 
field camp. And as you can see, it's basically just flat and white and very cold. Um, the West Antarctic ice sheet is about two miles thick. Um, and so what our team was doing is, um, well, actually, Waste Divide, the, the camp exists because it was a site for an ice core um, drilling project that finished up a couple years ago. And so now there's a borehole left um, that goes almost all the way down to the bedrock. It's about 3,400 meters. Um, and what our team was doing is actually measuring the borehole as it is today. And the plan is to go back in two years and measure it again. So you can see in the drawing on the top right, um, the line, the red line that says today is about where we expect it the borehole to be. Um, and the little uh, arrows and the, the line on top in purple is the exact point of the divide. So that's the place where the ice flow divides into two separate directions, as you can see. And so the borehole was drilled on one side of that divide. And our hypothesis is that within the next two years, we're going to see that entire borehole just kind of shift um, in the direction of the ice flow. Um, and so on the bottom left, you can see our researcher, Aaron Pettit, um, lowering our instrument, which is an acoustic televiewer, into the borehole. Um, and so that was connected to a winch um, to our computer. And it was lowered all the way down to the bottom and back a couple times. And with that, we were able to measure and map the borehole exactly as it is today. And um, so you can see the bottom right, our team mascot, Goldie Blocks, is looking at the data that we're collecting. So um, it, we lowered the instrument really slowly, and it used sound signals to map the shape of the borehole. And for the most part, um, we were able to see that the borehole is perfectly round, and it is perfectly straight, um, and pretty much as expected um, based on how they uh, how they drilled for the ice core. And when the team goes back in two years, they are expecting to see a lot more deformation, um, a lot more tilt, and also a lot of um, bulging in different places. And we've actually already, in the data that we collected, we were able to see some of that all the way towards the bottom of the borehole, which was a little bit unexpected, but kind of exciting for the team because um, it shows that the instrument is working and it shows that we are able to map kind of the movement of the entire ice sheet just by sort of pinpointing our way down um, in this one location. Um, so if you can go to the next slide. Um, the top right picture is uh, another way that we looked at gathering data about the ice sheet. Um, we use GPS and phase sensitive radar. And that gave us another view into the ice. Um, and in addition to that, the team will be looking at samples of ice and studying um, the crystal structure of the ice and, and looking at how the microstructure on, a, on an individual ice crystal level is affecting the global mechanics and the dynamics of the entire ice sheet and how it's moving and deforming. Um, so that was it for our main research project. In addition to that, we did some extra fun stuff with some of the time that we had. And so the top left picture, you see um, one of the walls of an ice pit that we dug. Um, and so something that was really important to our project is the different layers of snow and ice and um, what you can see in those different layers. And so in our ice pit, you can kind of see how different layers of snowfall look. Um, the little stained glass feature is was our artistic solution to a little mess up when someone got a little too overzealous and punched a hole through our ice wall. Um, and then the bottom two pictures that you see are um, a little bonus trip that we were able to do. We got to go to Blood Falls in the Dry Valleys um, to pull out some instruments that Aaron had left behind from a previous uh, research project. So 
Um, that's her on the right, the bottom right, at one of the data stations. And um, that's, that's it for this slide. Okay. And so it's fine. Sorry. Oh, go ahead. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Um, so as far as our outreach, um, I am not in a classroom right now. I'm actually working um, on a startup school. So we don't have our students yet, all of our students yet. So um, I've been doing a lot of outreach to schools in the area, going around giving presentations both before and after um, the expedition. And the other big outreach project that we're working on right now is an Antarctic art contest. Um, so if any of you guys or your students want to get involved um, in creating any type of art that's inspired by any of the science that they've learned about Antarctica from you guys, um, uh, there is a website for it, which is right there. Awesome. Thanks. And uh, we've just extended the deadline to October 31st. So um, we're taking submissions in pretty much any medium, and the idea with the art contest is really just to get kids thinking creatively about um, Antarctica and how it inspires them. Um, and also to sort of work interdisciplinarily. Um, and we did create a lesson plan along with this art contest, which um, I'll be uploading as soon as I get the final approval from Erin. Uh, so yeah, it's open until October 31st, and I think the, the winning submissions will get the chance to have their art displayed at the NSF as well as at University of Alaska at Fairbanks as well as in Antarctica. The next time the team goes down, they'll actually take the pieces down and do a little gallery show on the ice at Waste Divide. So it's kind of a cool opportunity. Um, and if you guys have any questions, you can contact me about it. And that's it. Great job, Yanini. Thank you so much. You've been busy and starting a new school. That's pretty, that's, that's great. <laughs> I'm sure it keeps you happen. Uh, Yanini's uh, team uh, is, I think Aaron's on the ice right now, so I don't think we have anybody to uh, reflect on what it was like working with us teacher and their experience, but um, we've had good feedback from the team and they've enjoyed working with uh, you many before too. So, um, and I must say you were, you were delayed an entire year as well. <laughs> so we're glad that you finally got to go out. Yeah. Um, so the next uh, team is, um, da, 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 da. sorry, I was looking at something else. The next team is Armando. Armando. Yeah, yeah, Armando, are you Yes, do you hear me? Yes, we do. Go ahead, Thank Armando. You. Okay, my name is Armando. Uh, I went to the South Pole on January 2015, and I went there to work with the uh, Ice Cube uh, Neutrino Observatory, which is right at the South Pole. Uh, actually, that's a picture from the, uh, from the Ice Cube team, the Ice Cube members. And we took that picture about 10 or 15 minutes before leaving the South Pole. That, that was one of our last pictures there. And uh, everyone is smiling because they, that was experience of a lifetime. That was awesome. Um, I was selected in November 2013. And uh, I was chosen to assist with research at the Ice Cube Neutrino South Pole Observatory. Uh, I traveled to Antarctica in January 2015. And I spent there 18 days. Uh, it was a really good experience because I was able to visit two of the three uh, permanent research stations that the United States maintains in the, uh, in the Antarctic. Uh, I was able to spend 10 days uh, doing maintenance and support work at the Ice Cube Telescope. And I was also able to stay for eight additional days at the McMurdo Station on the Antarctica coast. And uh, it was a really good experience because uh, seeing by yourself, being able to see the contrast between the Antarctica coast and the Antarctic plateau uh, where the South Pole sits uh, is an amazing experience. Uh, can we go to the next slide? The next one. 
Thank you. Uh, I work in four main areas. Uh, we did some testing of the ERA neutrino detector, which is a new experiment that will measure radio waves generated by the interaction of neutrinos with the Antarctic ice, which is actually uh, a bit different from the main neutrino detector, uh, which is buried under the, under the ice. The main neutrino detector uh, basically uses photomultiplier tubes to, uh, to detect Cherenkov light, which is visible light, blue light, uh, which is obtained uh, because of the interaction with the neutrinos with the Antarctic ice. So ERA uh, is trying to measure radio waves generated by the interaction of neutrinos with the Antarctic ice. Uh, second, I did troubleshooting of new and taggers at the ISTOP experiment which studies the interaction of cosmic rays with the Earth's uh, atmosphere. Uh, IceCube is a really interesting uh, experiment uh, because it's not only able to detect neutrinos, but it's also able to, uh, to detect cosmic rays. And uh, actually, most of the events that have been detected so far are uh, cosmic rays. But the, re the real meaningful events uh, have been like 37 neutrino events that have been uh, identified in uh, in three years of data. That was 2000, 2011, 2012, and 2013. Uh, I also did measurement of snow accumulation over ice top tanks to identify possible detrimental effects of snow coverage on cosmic ray detection. Uh, can we go to the previous slide just for a moment? And um, thank you. Uh, there. Uh, the one which is at the uh, lower left, uh, that's me actually with, uh, with a measuring stick doing some measurements of snow accumulations. Uh, what they did, and that's the, that's the ice cube laboratory in the background. Uh, what they did, uh, they inserted over 5,000 sensors uh, in a cubic kilometer of ice below the surface, below the ice cube laboratory that you can see there. But what they did, and this is me working with the ice stops experiment, uh, they also left a couple, a uh, few detectors. Uh, that was uh, 80 stations, and every station contains uh, two, uh, two small uh, detectors. And so that's, those detectors are like half a meter below the surface. So that's me uh, taking some uh, snow accumulation measurements. Can we go to the next one? Okay, thank you. And uh, and I also did uh, uh, support the public outreach efforts for IceCube, which included, of course, writing online bilingual daily journals, and that's also a polar track requirement. And there are like 22 daily journals, and uh, I also participated in two live internet presentations from the poll. Uh, I think we had like 500 people uh, with the first webcast, and we had like 300 people with the second uh, webcast, which, which we did in Spanish. Uh, I came back to Puerto Rico, and starting in early February, went on to shared experience. Uh, I have been teaching, uh, uh, I've been doing lots of uh, lots of activities uh, with my classes, sharing my South Pole experience. Uh, the kids have been, they are amazed that someone here from the tropic actually made it to the South Pole. And I, as a result, 190 students have been exposed to my poetry experience. I have also given 26 invited lectures that as of May 1st, uh, so far I have already given like 35 or something like that. Uh, total direct audience as of May 1st was uh, 1,242 persons. And uh, I also achieved 110 media hits, including one magazine cover, which is the one that you see in the middle, and, uh, and lots, of, lots of press coverage because the, the, uh, all the main newspapers here in the island were, uh, were really amazed that someone from, that, that a teacher from Puerto Rico made it to the South Pole. So, uh, I got lots of media coverage. Uh, I also did two uh, television interviews and one radio interview, so uh, I've been keeping a really busy agenda. So, <laughs> so that's my summary. Uh, any questions? I uh, welcome questions, and I'm available to answer them. 
Yeah, Armando, can you click off your mic real quickly? Okay. Okay, that way I won't uh, do feedback. Uh, in case you didn't see it, you did get some feedback in the uh, chat while you were talking about uh, your busyness and impressed with uh, all your outreach and you have done a fantastic job. Um, and I should ask quickly of the phone people since we can't hear from them and uh, so forth, um, is there anybody out there that's just using the phone that uh, would like to ask a question or provide any feedback at the moment? And I also want to see, did Jim Manson make it on the phone? Okay. He, he was driving around, so we weren't sure. I heard a beep a while ago, and I wasn't sure if that was him or not. So, okay. Well, good job, um, Armando. Uh, thanks for sharing all of that. Um, I think, let's see, we'll go to the next uh, person. See, that is uh, Dominique, and hopefully she's still with us on the phone. Uh, Dominique, are you there? We have your slide up um, that just introduces your um, location and the funded title, and then we can just cue us to the next slide for your slides. Okay, I am still here. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes, we can. All right. Um, so I went out on the Nathaniel B. Palmer with Frank Nietzsche and his research team, and we were looking at the vulnerability of um, ice streams in East Antarctica to warm water. Um, there are a lot of ice streams and glaciers in that area that are thinning and losing a lot of mass, and one of the hypotheses is that there's warm water coming up from below and melting them from underneath. And so we were going out to look for deep underwater troughs created by um, ice streams moving and creating these deep valleys um, that could possibly be letting in warm water underneath these ice sheets and melting them. And we um, used a couple different methods. We used multi-beam bathymetry and sent sound down to the bottom of the ocean floor, bounced back to us, and we used that to be able to map the topography of the continental shelf and the conti um, continental slope and look for these deep troughs. And we also use uh, CTD to collect ocean water samples and measure the temperature and salinity of um, the water coming up on the shelf. And we actually found, well, we didn't find those um, troughs, but we did find that there was an impact of the height, I guess, of the continental shelf and how that allowed warm water to come in and melt some of these glaciers from below, um, whereas it didn't have as large of an impact on um, other glaciers that we were looking at in the area. Um, also on board the ship with us, we had a team of researchers from Australia who were using UAVs um, or drones to do sea ice surveys, and so they were testing it out. This is a new method being used, and we were able to observe their um, test flights, which was very cool. Um, it was a really great opportunity to get a chance to work with all of the different scientists. They were all so accommodating and so eager to help with the outreach that we did. Um, and it was also a very exciting experience. There were lots of storms and lots of wildlife and stuff out there. Um, if you head to my second slide, we can take a look at uh, the outreach we've been doing. We did do a lot of outreach from the ship. Um, we had a very big social media following, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, lots of people on Instagram following along. Um, and we had our Polar Connect from the ship, which we also did a live event at the uh, aquarium I work at and had a really good turnout there. And we also did a flag art contest, which we had a ton of kids participate in. It was incredibly exciting for the kids to get to see their flags win and be flown in Antarctica and get their um, art design turned into um, an actual flag. Um, in addition to that, I've been doing lots of outreach through school. Since I don't have um, a school myself, we've been visiting um, a lot of schools, um, inner city schools, downtown LA, to get the word out to kids. 
Um, and then through some charter schools I'm affiliated with doing like parent nights and having, um, I don't want to say mommy and me, but parent and me classes um, where the kids can come in and try out experiments. Uh, we've also done one teacher workshop with more um, planned to share the lessons based on our um, research expedition, um, as well as we've put up an exhibit on the science of climate change focusing on Frank's work as well as the work of some other polar track teachers and researchers that have gone out too. Um, and we have more outreach planned coming up. So I think that's it for me. Okay. Yeah, I, um, thanks so much. And uh, I know you had a, your teacher workshop just recently. How did that go? That was your first one, right? Yeah, our first teacher workshop went great. We had um, a ton of teachers show up. They were really excited by the lessons, and they were super excited to know that this opportunity was out there. So you're probably going to be flooded with um, applications from the Southern California area. <laughs> Excellent. That's all right. We'll have you review them all, Dominique. <laughs> oh, thanks. Thanks. <laughs> all right. And I don't think your researcher is on here. So um, I think we're going to move on to, uh, yep, there is our data changed on to the alumni advice section. And we do have alumni John Wood, who is um, here to uh, share a little bit about his experiences and his advice uh, to all of you. So I'll turn it over to John. Okay. Hello, everybody. <clears throat> hey, uh, you know, first off, you just have to say that uh, you all have done a fantastic job this season. And I know some of you waited quite a long time to get around to it, but, you know, the, the creativity that everybody has displayed and the amount of effort that everybody's put into the projects, uh, you know, not only using online sources, but, you know, good old hands-on stuff and reaching out to the community at adult levels and uh, student levels and all kinds of things. Wow. It is truly, truly uh, fantastic to see what everybody's accomplished. And I congratulate all of you. It sounds like you all had a wonderful time. Uh, which is what it should have been, okay? So good. So now I've got that out of the way because I'm sitting here in awe of everything. Uh, you know, I, I really don't have a lot of new things to say. Uh, you know, I just, uh, I know as far as following up and, and keeping the energy moving, you guys sound like you've got a great jump on that. Alex, you've just been, you haven't stopped now for quite a while, so wow. Uh, you know, I just, uh, want to point out a few things in case they haven't crossed your radar yet. Um, opportunities like Antarctica Day, you know, December 1st. Uh, there's always organizations and uh, PEI and Polar Trek always looking to be represented there. Lots of ways to get involved with activities uh, online and, and in your communities, along with the Polar Week. Uh, activities that go on every year uh, that are, uh, you know, sponsored by several organizations. Uh, and then, you know, I just briefly, uh, I have been, you know, involved with Science Fair lately. And, you know, the response to some of these kids coming forward and really being grabbed by the concept of Antarctica and what's going on down there. And then uh, developing Science Fair projects uh, here in Orange County and in Los Angeles and different areas. Uh, it's turned out to be a very powerful thing. Uh, so I, I just want to mention that. And then obviously, you know, there's the conferences and the meetings and, you know, the, the teacher uh, PD and everything else that's been going on, uh, which you guys have covered fantastically well. Uh, really, I, I just applaud all of you and, uh, you know, congratulations on a great year. I know that you'll be available um, for these folks throughout the next couple of years, I'm sure, to bounce ideas off of. And, and you're definitely a great example of, of moving into the sort of next couple of steps after you're a Polar Trek teacher in the field and how to connect yourself and other educators and more researchers. So thanks for all your hard work, too. 
Um, and so I'm going to turn it over to Michelle. Um, so these two alumni came to our orientation for this group and are able to share a little bit more. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just want to echo what John said, which is I am so impressed with all the work everyone has done. Um, I was, I don't know if I was in as good of a place at this point, so I'm very impressed. And um, I'm, I actually wanted to in, to talk about how it may not be that you might not have that much outreach happening at this point, um, but it sounds like you do. So maybe this, I'm going to tweak this talk a little because it's pretty impressive what you've been doing. Um, so I, I was out 2011, 2012, and when I got back from the field, I did some outreach. Um, but I kind of, I was a little disappointed with the amount of um, outreach I was able to do returning from the expedition. I think I had higher expectations for um, what I can do. I'm holding a polychaete worm there, which had just been placed, I just saw the comment, which had just been placed in my hands from um, our diver in the background. Uh, so that's the look on my face was I wasn't expecting to be holding that. Um, if you could go to the next slide. <laughs> not what it looks like. Uh, so it sounds like you guys are not being tortoises here. It sounds like you are being hares and moving quite quickly and, and really um, sucking the marrow out of this experience, which is amazing. Uh, but you may find after things continue that you reach a lull and um, it gets harder and harder to keep um, finding uh, big big events to to get your outreach out there and get your message from your expedition out there. At least I, I struggled with that over the long term. And what I learned from it is that um, I actually find the most meaningful aspects of my expedition experiences have happened in the long run and not in the short run. And they haven't happened in these big, exciting events, but more in the day-to-day -day events. And so I just wanted to talk a little bit about that to, to keep your mind open to that. So if you could go to the next slide. Um, the first piece is the research team uh, doesn't, it sounds like you're all having great relationships with your researchers. Um, and I know I've been very lucky about that. I just, I'm, I put these slides together quickly. I just took a screenshot of my email contact with Bob Melville, who um, I actually just had dinner with on Tuesday night, <laughs> so or Monday night. Um, and it's great because these researchers that you work with become friends and become colleagues who you can continue talking about ideas with. In fact, um, a lot of engineering ideas that I've tried to push into my classroom have come from dinners with Bob and Andy. Um, and I also keep in touch with my other expedition groups. So just um, I would try to make an effort to reach out to your team and keep those relationships going because that is a really big part for me of um, the importance of this whole program is getting in touch with these researchers and really getting to um, interact with scientists every day. As a teacher, I don't usually get to do that. Um, next, if you can go to the next slide too. Um, the other thing that I really wanted to talk about was kind of the, the small ways that you can push this experience into your classroom over a long term. A long term. Uh, the first two, solar radiation cans and solstice and seasons. I um, I'm teaching in I was teaching in a public school in Texas. And now I'm teaching in a region line school. So my content is pretty strict, and I'm not allowed to have a lot of um, days afforded to just. Experience explore Antarctica. So I, I was a little frustrated at first with how to do this, but over the years, there's so many ways you can take experiences from your research and just from being in the Arctic or Antarctic into your classroom. Um, two examples are the top two there. But the other two that um, have taken me a little bit longer to figure out are just little ways in which you can take what you're teaching or what you're, for a museum outreach, little ways that you can take those pieces and pull in things from your experiences. For example, whenever I teach about weather, I can show the um, weather station that I set up in Antarctica and I talk about it and the kids, all of a sudden the fact that you're in that picture and you're talking about something that you've done and making a connection between polar science and the curriculum you're covering makes that curriculum richer. It, it brings in polar science and kids have a lot of questions that come out. Um, my other struggle was I, I really wanted to tell the story of my expeditions and the specific research we were doing 
but it didn't really align to my curriculum. Um, so I started doing a picture of the day. Well, I do picture of the days every day of the week, but every Friday it was freezing Friday, and I would just pull a few pictures from my past blogs and tell a quick story about what I was doing with the research, um, starting from the beginning of the expedition and going the way through. And I feel like kids really got a deeper sense of, of all the aspects of my expedition over the course of the year. Um, and then, of course, I'd keep in touch with my researchers, and we would Skype with them. And they, my students already knew the whole um, research pro program. They didn't have to spend time talking about what they did, and they could use that information and really dig in. So those are just some small ways you can keep this experience going. And I still feel like I'm learning many ways to incorporate it into the classroom and into my life. Um, and yet I'm not, I have to admit, I'm not doing a lot of the outreach events and the, the kind of heavier hitter aspects of it. Um, and so just keep your mind open. It's a really long journey. And I still am using Polar Tech in my life today. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah, very good. Uh, I see some ideas also being shared through chat about a hashtag or Freezing Friday or you could you could we could go off on that for quite a while, but it's a great way to uh, integrate and uh, a lot of comments, Michelle, also about um, just visually seeing your chat log there or your email log of your correspondence back and forth with your researcher, and um, that's just a, a nice visual to show um, how how much uh, communications you have. And I thought it was fun that you uh, see Bob Melville. Also, it's been I had a call with him not too long ago, so it's it's nice to that you stay connected in that way. Um, we also have uh, Alex, you're an alumni, and so we just wanted to touch base with you if there's anything you wanted to um, add or um, contribute to the alumni perspective here. Okay. Alex is not on the phone at this time. Michelle says she has to go, so email her any questions. Um, Alex will type something in the chat if she wants to share it. And um, I think with that, um, I'll turn this over to Sarah to finish up. Sure, thanks. So this does um, pertain a little bit more to this current cohort. Um, and so a few things that are coming up for y'all, uh, as you're looking down this list, just kind of do a mental check of where you're at on some of these things, and some of them are just reminders too. So I know you've probably been seeing some emails from our evaluation team. Um, there are the, there's a classroom survey or the implementation survey, and then the knowledge uh, content test. So there's a couple folks that need to do some of those post surveys. So that would be great if you can get those done pretty soon. Um, expedition pages are always open to you. So even if you're done doing your expedition, you are welcome to continue using it and post about uh, new updates from the team or outreach that you're doing. If you have any questions about how to use the expedition pages or ideas for it, just let us know and we're glad to help figure out how you can best use it. For social networking, there's lots of options. So make sure that you're part of the Polar Education email list. Um, and I'm trying to send that out to everybody uh, to get updates on different events happening with our partner organizations and if um, we have any calls for different projects that are going on. So make sure you're a part of that. Um, a lot of you know that we have our Facebook group that is just for researchers and teachers that are alumni of the program, so sharing lots of information from the polar science community. And then we have our Twitter feed um, at Polar Trek, so make sure you're checking that out too. Um, travel requests, if you are hoping to get back together with the research team and going back to the lab and analyzing data or presenting at a conference together, be sure to ask us for travel funds, and we'll send you our travel request form and see what we can fit in. But it'd be great to continue that relationship with your teams by doing some travel to their lab or having them come to your classroom or um, going off to meetings together. So that might be a science meeting or education meeting. So you know, always ask if you have a question or thought about how to best use your time and energy with Polar Trek. And let's see, for requirements, um, a lot of people in this cohort are 
on top of it. Thanks so much for sending in lessons, public science reports, gear is almost all back. So as you look down this list, just remind yourself if there's one or two things that are due um, post expedition and make sure those lessons are vetted your science team and then send those over to us. The public science report, I think I think everybody online has turned in their science report. Um, a couple pieces of gear to out there. If you have your photos and you haven't sent them in yet, um, just email me and we can figure out the best way for you to get that information to us. And let's see, um, your requirements, so the, the list, just make sure it's up to date, the checklist. It's really helpful to keep track for us and for you, and so I don't bug you too much. And then um, one year from now, or one year from your expedition, we hope that you've come back through the education and outreach plan, taking a look at what you said you thought you might be doing um, for outreach, for implementation in the classroom, that kind of stuff. And just give yourself a little update on those, sort of finalize those drafts so that you can say, well, we thought about doing this. It worked out better to do you know, X, Y, and Z. And these tools are really useful for future teachers to see what it looks like to plan ahead for an expedition and then how to execute these things when you get back. These pieces are all part of your portfolio that are now available for folks to check out. So we mentioned that earlier. All those pieces are out there. So it's great to have the finalized drafts within about a year of your expedition. You can always check out the emergency cold weather gear, extreme cold weather gear from us. We have four kits. And if you don't find the link in the teacher manual online, just let me know and I can send it to you. But it is free for you to get down to your classroom or to an event, let kids try on the ECW gear, and then we'll probably have you mail it off to another teacher and we can use the Argus FedEx account for that so you don't have to pay for it. Um, so there's four of those floating around the country. And then continued collaboration. And you know, I won't elaborate too much more on that because John, Michelle, and everybody really touched on that well. What's coming up real soon? A couple of new things. So Bill Schmoker, you probably remember him from orientation, listening to him talk about videos and photos. He is headed out on a Coast Guard to Healy in August through October for a long um, to late Arctic expedition. So be sure to be following him as he heads out. We actually have a, uh, the, the AOK -OK from the National Science Foundation to support some Antarctic expeditions for this coming winter. So this is new for us and we are figuring this out uh, day by day at the moment, but there will be some Antarctic expeditions that are occurring this winter. So be sure to follow those and we will get the information out to you. We, I think you've probably all seen in emails here and there that we have been sort of approved for funding for the next couple of years and we're working out all the details right now. But applications for the 2016-17 field seasons will be open in July. So the best place to check that information out is that polar education list and be sure to send the information around to colleagues and friends who might be interested. And as we go through that process, we'll be looking for people who want to be part of the selection committee, which means reading a section, a subsection of the, the uh, applications that have come in and getting together on a phone call and talking through the merits of each application and if they should move on to the next round, kind of a more um, specific round and moving towards the interviews with researchers. So you can be a part of the process if you're interested. Um, we might send out an email to folks, but if you are interested in doing that, it's a bit of a commitment at the beginning of the school year, but we'd love to have you. So send us an email if you're curious. Um, I'm going to turn it over to this last side of ideas and needs and questions, but Janet, is there anything else that you wanted to add? Uh, no, not really. I think just uh, uh, keep us posted. Uh, um, if in particular, if you want to be like uh, John just said, he wants to be part of the selection committee, or if you're a researcher, you know, and you're interested in doing that as well. Um, so yeah, nothing else. It's been uh, great to hear from everybody so far. Great, and we do have Elaine Hood on the line. Elaine, do you want to um, jump in and say anything? I just really, really appreciate the effort the teachers and everybody put into this. It's so good to see these slides with the photos and hear a synopsis of the science and what outreach people are doing. So 
I'm thrilled and I'm excited to move forward in the future with the teachers. Great. Thanks, Elaine, and thanks for all your hard work. Um, I'm going to open it up to anybody that's online or on the phone. Um, do you have any ideas or needs or questions at this point from us? We'll give you a minute to think if there's anything sort of coming up for you in the last hour or so. All right. Well, I'm sure you all know where to get a hold of us, Janet and I, Elaine, or the alumni who are always there to help support you. So um, we'll leave it at that. The um, event will be archived in the next couple of days, and we'll get the link out to everybody. Um, for teachers that were online here with us that didn't have their researchers attending, it would be great if you can send them a paragraph of um, how it went, what you shared, and um, and let them know they're welcome to sort of comment back to us, and they'll get the link as well. So make sure to sort of loop back and make that connection for them, for those who couldn't attend. That would be great. And uh, we hope to talk to you all soon. Email us, call us, anything, and, and we're here for you and excited to start another year. Yes, we are. You guys did a great job. It was really fun to catch up with you, even though we didn't get to see your faces. All right, so we'll sign off for now. Thanks, everybody, and have a great afternoon and evening. Bye. Thank you. All. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.